Density has downsides as well as advantages. If two people are close enough to exchange an idea face to face, they're also close enough to share a virus. Contagious diseases, including cholera and AIDS, have slaughtered urban populations throughout the ages. A boy born in New York City in 1900, like a boy born in Shakespeare's London, could expect to live at least six years less than a boy born in the countryside. Today, life expectancies in New York City are about two years longer than the national average, and big cities are more likely to be known for their bike lanes and marathons than for their plagues. Perhaps some new epidemic will emerge that will make New York's density deadly once more. But at least for now, the cities of the wealthy world are no longer scourged by contagion. How did the terribly unhealthy cities of 1800 or even 1900 become the relatively hygienic places of today? The first step was clean water and sewerage. Indeed, a reasonable view is that providing clean water is the single most important job of city government. Before 1800, cities had only one major health tool, quarantine, isolating the sick. New York suffered so many deaths from yellow fever during the 1790s, partially because the city's mercantile ethos made it difficult to stop the landing of ships like the Zephyr in 1795 that carried the illness in from the tropics. No one really understood the role that mosquitoes played in transmitting the disease, and some people thought that there was a connection with unclean water. Perhaps that mistaken view reflected the thirst of those who suffered from yellow fever. Consequently, the deadly yellow fever outbreaks prodded both New York and Philadelphia to improve their water systems. Philadelphia had more civic strength than New York in the 1790s, and the city of brotherly love came together to build public waterworks, which were designed by Benjamin Latrobe, Latrobe would later be killed by yellow fever while working on the New Orleans waterworks. New York tried using a private company, which didn't work because that company preferred the profits of banking to the pain of building water pipes. It took another generation for the city to take action. Cholera came to New York in 1832, and while the disease wasn't understood, surely the filthy water didn't help. The Great Fire of 1835 also emphasized the need for abundant water. This time, there was to be a public undertaking, a vast aqueduct. But the costs of the aqueduct were meant to be borne by water fees. Households needed to pay $10 for a connection, and then added fees based on the amount of water that they used. There were free water hydrants, but in 1860, there were only 2,307 hydrants in the city, or about one for every 10 acres, and water is heavy to carry. Consequently, the poor stuck to their shallow, polluted wells, and they continued to die from cholera. The story of New York City's health is often told as a tale of engineering triumphalism. The city was unhealthy, and then great builders erected the aqueduct, and clean waters from upstate eradicated disease. But cholera epidemics continued to rage for 25 years after Croton opened in 1842. My great-great-great-grandfather died in New York's 1849 cholera epidemic. Healthy cities need both incentives and engineering. This is true in sub-Saharan Africa today, where water mains are built, typically with some external aid. But the city's poor understandably refuse to pay the $1,000 cost of connecting to the water main. New York's death rates didn't start to decline until after the 1866 epidemic. By that time, medical knowledge had increased, thanks to John Snow over in London. And by 1867, New York doctors knew that polluted water was the problem. The state empowered a board of health led by the remarkable Dr. Stephen Smith, which then required landowners to pay for connections to sewers and water pipes. Not every landowner complied, but many did rather than face legal penalties. The ownerless nature of developing world slums today makes it harder to impose such obligations there. The Health Board's actions essentially ended cholera epidemics, but contagious disease still spread in the city. The next step was to improve the cleanliness of city streets. After the Civil War, street cleaners were paid by the city, but they returned much of their payment in bribes to Tammany Hall, and they didn't do much street cleaning. Reformers like W.R. Grace worked to provide a strong, independent street cleaning agency. New York's 19th century street cleaning reached its zenith under the sanitary engineer George Waring, who, starting in 1895, waged war against the mountains of manure that horses left on city streets. Waring was honest and tough, and he was helped by the increasing use of concrete for street paving during the 1890s. By 1930, New York City had become about as healthy as the nation as a whole. But then, after 1960, the city started becoming deadly again. Initially, it was human behavior, not contagion, that was to blame. Homicides rose dramatically from 1960 to 1975. There were more drug deaths as well. And then a new and deadly contagious disease came to New York. AIDS probably came from Haiti to the U.S. around 1969. By 1978, AIDS was still undiagnosed, but probably one in 20 gay men in New York was HIV positive. 
By the 1980s, thousands were dying from the disease, which cut a terrible path through New York's creative community. Halston, Perry Ellis, and Arthur Ashe are just a few of the famous New Yorkers who died from the disease. By 1990, life expectancy for male New Yorkers was four years below the national average. But AIDS was tamed, first through sexual caution and then through effective treatment. Homicides fell as New York City became safer. The city's drug markets were reduced, and heroin deaths fell. New Yorkers, prodded by the anti-smoking efforts of Michael Bloomberg, radically reduced their cigarette habits. By 2000, New York City was again as healthy as the nation as a whole. And by 2010, New York's life expectancies were two years longer than the national average. Now this was unexpected. Good public health perhaps can eliminate the risks of deadly contagious diseases in cities, but why should urbanites live longer? There are many hypotheses for why older New Yorkers might die less often. Some people credit walking. Others emphasize the social connections that are made in cities. A third view is that only the healthy are willing to put up with the costs of continuing to live in New York. We don't really know. But we do know why younger New Yorkers die less often. Suicides and motor vehicle accidents are two major sources of death for the under 45 crowd, and these are much rarer in cities. It is just a whole lot safer to take a subway home after a few drinks than to get behind the wheel of a car, and New York has far fewer drivers than the rest of the country. New York's low suicide rates are more of a puzzle, especially since New Yorkers are less likely to say that they are happy than most Americans. Perhaps New Yorkers actually are happier, but they just have a cultural norm against admitting it. Perhaps the city has fewer guns around than rural America, and that leads to fewer gun suicides. We don't know. But we do know that New York's health is a triumph, reflecting massive investments in public health and regulations that pushed people to act in ways that lead them to live longer.